and uh, we'll probably start with our next speaker. So again, the the way the sessions move is that each speaker has 20 minutes, and then I'll try to do a 10-minute Q&A after the speakers uh, done with their presentations. Our next speaker is uh, about the Open Data Cube sandbox using Google Colab uh, from NASA. The speaker is Mr. Uh, Dr. Brian Killo. He has 34 years of NASA experience and leads the Committee on Earth Observing Satellite Systems Engineering Office. The SEO supports the International CEOS Organization Coordinating Satellite Earth Observation Data for Global Benefit. Dr. Kilo has played a significant role in the evolution of the Open Data Cube initiative and the development of the Africa Regional Data Cube. Dr. Kilo received his BS degree from the University of Virginia, his MS degree from George Washington University, and his PhD from the College of William and Mary. He has authored over 20 technical papers and received the NASA Exceptional Service Medal in 2016. So everyone, please Welcome, Dr. Brian Kill. Thank you very much, Francis. Appreciate that intro. I will uh, share my screen and, and jump over. Hello, everyone. Let me take this on here. Hang on one second. If all this goes well. Can everybody see that okay? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, as Francis said, thanks for the intro. Uh, I'm Brian Killo from NASA, and I run an office called the CIOS Systems Engineering Office. So today I'm going to tell you about something called the Open Data Cube Sandbox, and we're using Google Colab for this activity. So my first uh, way to introduce you to, to jump in, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this whole idea of Open Data Cube, what's it all about, the Open Earth Alliance, which is a new initiative as a geo community activity that uh, is being used to exploit that. And then I'll show you a little bit about what this sandbox looks like in our, in our plans for the future. But first, I need to tell you what we mean by a data cube, because I'll be talking about this concept of a data cube quite a bit here today. So if you want to think, uh, the, the simplest way to think about this is we, we traditionally think of satellite data Oh, I'm going to have, hang on just one second. This is, I'm. Apologies for that. Thought I had caught, uh, solved all that problem. Um, satellite data for many days uh, have been or organized and we put them in a cube that has latitude, longitude, and time. So if you think about the dimensions of this cube, lat, lon, and time, all the pixels from the scenes that you would typically download are then organized in a database structure in latitude, longitude, and time. And that's what we call a data cube. It makes it much easier to interrogate that data and to utilize it in analyses. So the, the smallest component of that cube are what we call pixels. And so those pixels, in the case of Landsat, there's an example here where those pixels give us data on the scale of 30 meters. And that's about the size of a baseball diamond. So if you look on the bottom left, that is what the, the visual image of my like the RGB. And you can see the green in the infield there in the outfield, uh, you know, the grass in the stadium. You can see the white surrounding the bright um, concrete from the structure and then some of the brown surrounding, which is, you know, a mix of, of other structure. But each one of those little tiles, those pixels in the in the middle, is about the size of the ball of the infield. And so, when we pull this data together in a cube, it's much easier to use. So, how did this data cube idea begin, and and where we are now? Since 2007 and the release of the Landsat data, that really kicked all of this off, and and got us going. And then Sentinel came along in around 2013 or 14 and started releasing data. So now, here we are, you know, 2021, we have an incredible amount of this data and it's showing up in a lot of places that it's easy to get to. So back in um, the late 2000s, 
uh, Australia had started this data cube concept. It was working very well. And a lot of us in the CIOS organization, which we're an organization of satellite agencies around the world, we thought, why not use this globally? Let's take this out and expand it. So a number of us in that organization came together. We started some prototypes. Uh, Switzerland, Colombia, and Vietnam were our first prototypes. We then created an Africa regional data cube, which eventually uh, is now part of a multi-million dollar Digital Earth Africa project. And then data sets in general are moving to the cloud. We've we've heard that uh, today. You've got things in Earth Engine, you've got stuff on Amazon Cloud and Microsoft and then other clouds around the world. So the timing and the technology is good for things like an open data cube. And also the UN SDGs are inspiring a lot of countries around the world to use this data. So that's where we come around with this idea or the concept of the open data cube. So what we do is if moving from left to right, this open data cube is a basically a data management framework or data management uh, and analysis structure. On the far left would be the data. Where do we get the data? We typically go to a cloud to get that. In the case here for our sandbox, we utilize Earth Engine. We then move to the middle and that's where the open data cube infrastructure is. So what we do is we have some, some installation software, some things that we, we tap into to then connect us with the applications on the far right, which are Jupyter Notebooks written in Python, and how do we connect that to the Earth Engine data? That's where this Open Data Cube sandbox comes in in the middle. So we have some very simple processes that uh, through a, a couple lines of code and loading up just a few utilities, it allows us to tap into that data and run some applications. That's what I'm going to demonstrate for you today and show you. So again, in the past, this was all started in Australia with the data cube, and then the concept was moved forward by the CIOS organization. Digital Earth Africa um, is operational now. We have Digital Earth Pacific and the Americas, which are regional data cube activities. They're starting to get moving. And overall, we've impacted more than 100 countries around the world in some way or using the open data cube framework, which I think is really exciting. It's, it's spreading around people are interested, they're asking questions, they're learning from it, and they're using this because, again, it's an open source infrastructure. But our ultimate goal would be, can we have a global network of regional cubes where they use Open Data Cube as the infrastructure, which allows us to share and test algorithms in many places around the world? So where does this Open Earth Alliance fit in? Those, the Open Data Cube founding partners, what we did for the first um, probably three to five years is we concentrated on developing the core infrastructure and the code and getting this working and um, just pretty much putting everything out on, on GitHub and finding users that were wanted to integrate. We now want to go to the next step and we formed this thing called the Open Earth Alliance, which is just an activity at this point. It's a geo community activity. And the idea is to explore more things that we can do with data cubes or other open source solutions for that matter, but also gives us the ability to attract some external funding or some cloud credits or things from donors that could contribute to this activity. Uh, we didn't have an entity like that before. The open data cube up to now was just an open source software project. And now with Open Earth Alliance, it gives us a little more ability to expand and do some projects. So what's been achieved? We have this Open Data Cube sandbox I'm going to share with you today. We are developing some uh, training and workshop material. So we're doing a number of things with uh, Americas and Pacific Islands. We have a, a user forum. You can see the link there. And we uh, also were supportive in Earth Analytics Interoperability Lab, which is uh, being primarily used for the CIOS organization. There's also a lot of other innovation happening in the background. So a, a few of our partners are looking at how can we take data from UAVs and put them in an open data cube pipeline? How can we take data from Internet of Things uh, or voxel solutions? And so all of these are being tested in the background uh, as uh, possible technology leaps. So now let's move to this idea of the open data cube sandbox. So the office that I run, our systems engineering office, and one of the contractors I work with, Analytical Mechanics, we came up with this idea of the sandbox, and it runs on Google Colab. You can find everything. I'll repeat this uh, link again, but openearthalliance.org sandbox. That is where you will find everything you need to know about 
this uh, concept that I'm sh sharing with you here today. So the tool's free and open. It basically works on a Jupyter Notebook interface where that interface is connected to Google Earth Engine data sets. You can run small scale satellite applications anywhere in the world. You don't need to download any data. It runs very similar to uh, Earth Engine, but I'll show you a few differences in a moment. There are two things that are required. Number one is you need a Google account. Those of you that have a Gmail address or have ever uh, dabbled with anything in the Google framework, you probably have a Google account. The second thing is Earth Engine authorization. If you go to that sandbox link, there's a, a, another link there that'll show you how you can get Earth Engine authorization. It's, it's a rather quick step, but it just allows Google to track who is using the uh, Earth Engine framework. So a few questions here. Why, why do we care about using the Open Data Cube? Well, this conference here is Phosphor-G, which is about free and open source software for geospatial analyses. Well, that is exactly what this uh, whole project is all about. It's free and open source, and it, it works fantastic for geospatial analyses. There's a community of users around it, and I think it's a fantastic method for open science because anybody can use it, anybody can share it, and we can test methods and play around. So why do we use Google Earth Engine data? It's easily accessible. It's there. There's a lot of global satellite data. There's non-satellite data sets. It's free to use. So it's, it's a really simple choice. It's one of the clouds that allows us to get at this data. Now, the last hook to all of this is Google Colab. Google Colab is really the only free way to run Jupyter Notebooks and share them among users. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of what Google has offered through Colab, which is a, which is a notebook framework for running Python scripts and then allows us to share with other users because we can say, here's my notebook, here's a shareable link, I can share it with somebody else. And then um, I can run this anywhere I want, I can share it with other, other people, it's, it's really been a great collaborative environment. Um, but there are some limitations and I'll share with those uh, in a moment. So the data sets that we're using here, we're using Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, and Veer's Nightlights. Those are the ones that we've prepared the database and we have the Open Data Cube framework easily connects to those data sets. Others can be added. And, and so I, I ask anybody, uh, if you really have an interest there, uh, reach out to us and perhaps we can get that working. Here are the applications. I'm gonna show you the list of these applications uh, and what they look like if you go online. But we have cloud statistics allows you to sift through Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 data. You can create your own median mosaics look at water and spectral products, vegetation change and phenology, which is the growth of, of uh, agriculture. Uh, we've got a Sentinel-1 data viewer and we're working on some stuff for flooding. Uh, mission coincidences in Veer's nightlights. Here's just <clears throat> some pretty pictures of some of these results. You can see in the top left what a Landsat 8 scene might look like. In the center, the very colorful image is the water observation, which is the time series of water at any place in time. In the bottom center is night lights over Kumasi, Ghana. I believe uh, also on the far right, if, uh, bottom right is a fractional cover image over Kumasi, Ghana, where the red area is urban. Uh, the grayscale image is, is Sentinel-1 radar. And in the top right is a phenological curve of NDVI over a farm plot in Ghana. So this just gives you a few examples of what we can do. So a few more details because you need to know what the constraints are of using this environment. Again, it's free and open. Anybody can jump in and use this. It gives you about 12 gigabytes of RAM memory. What that basically means is I can only load a certain number of pixels into memory and then conduct an analysis. What does 12 gigabytes of RAM give you? Well, you just kind of have to play around with the combinations. We've done some tests. So Basically, you can't get much larger than about a one degree by one degree lat lawn region and maybe uh, several years in depth. That's about the most pixels you can load. Again, if you go to more higher resolution stuff like Sentinel-2, then since that's 10 meters, um, there's, you know, it start to have to use smaller areas. But if you use real small areas and you're doing this really just as a proof of concept, fantastic. If you want to scale it larger, I suggest taking this to the Google Cloud you can install Open Data Cube on Google Cloud and do all of this. So you can run up to five simultaneous notebooks at a time. Each one gets its own dedicated instance in Google, which is really fantastic because you have your own dedicated processing framework at that point, and you're not competing for resources. And you can save these notebooks. So you can take any one of the notebooks I'm going to show you, 
you can work with it, operate on it, and actually save it in your Google Drive, share it with other people, or modify it to your uh, desire, and use it anyhow you want. This is how we do development. So we start with some core notebooks, we do some development, keep them on Google Drive, do some testing, and then eventually we'll release them and throw them in our GitHub. And we have a user form that I mentioned before. So again, just to repeat, the first steps are you go to openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. You need a Google account. You need Earth Engine authorization. It could take minutes or it could take days. I can't guarantee which one, but sometimes it's rather quick. Um, you follow those steps. If you follow the steps on that page, um, on that sandbox page, I have given this to high school students, college students, and people that are somewhat novices, and they've been able to follow the steps and go through and run this and have found it quite interesting and exciting. It gives them the ability to actually run a Python script and Python code, modify that code very slightly, do something fun, and get some experience with satellite data. So yesterday, unfortunately, the timing was a bit flipped here for all of this. I would have liked to give this presentation followed by the workshop. But yesterday, I gave a one-hour workshop for the Phosphor G conference. And we took a more detailed look at several notebooks. I showed people how to run them. I showed them how to modify them. So that was yesterday. And it, it really um, it went quite well. So just a few more minutes. What I want to do now before I get back to the plans for the future, I'm just going to jump over real quick. And I'm going to go over to show you really quick what it looks like on the sandbox. When you go to openearthalliance.org slash sandbox, this is what it looks like. It gives you some information about creating a Google account, Earth Engine authorization. And then it shows you step by step what you need to do to run these notebooks. The key one here is this GitHub account. When you click on the GitHub account, this is what you what you show. And you will see a list of the notebooks that are available to you. These are standard simplified notebooks that run a, a number of applications. You can click on any one of these notebooks. I'll show you in a moment how it works. And you run one from beginning to end. They all run in approximately five minutes or less in the uh, in the state that they're they're given to you. You can modify them if you make the region larger, if you make the time longer, and 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 do certain things. Of course, it might take a little longer to run, but I've been able to run some pretty decent size analyses using this. So let's say if I look at one of these, the cloud statistics for L8 Landsat 8. Here's what it would look like. When I go there, this is, you're looking right now at a Python script. This is basically uh, what we call a notebook environment. There's only two pieces of code. These first two pieces of code are what get used and you run it for the first time. You then have to put in a, an Earth Engine authorization step. Those are the two pieces of code that get added on top of any notebook. Then when I look at this particular one, Landsat 8 Cloud Statistics, you can kind of follow the logic here, but I'm loading data cube configuration, our API, importing some utilities such as X-Array. I load up the Landsat 8 product. Nothing gets modified here, by the way. You don't need to touch any of this. And where it says modify here, this is where I might want to change the lat lon position and the box size. And I could pick a different spot in the world to do an analysis, and I can pick a different time extent. For this particular sample case, this is over Mombasa, Kenya. You can click on this map. You can zoom in and out like I'm doing here. You see it's a coastline here of Mombasa. If I want to find a new lat-lon position, you can click anywhere on this map and find the latitude-longitude position. So for this particular case, what it has done is it's created a table of cloud coverage and shows you how many of the pixels are clean, which means no clouds. So if you look at this list here for 2020, Here's the best scene. This is 91.9% .9 clean, so it's about 9% cloudy. And if I go down the last step, this is just a plot of that table. And at the very end here where it says modify here, I pick the time slice that I want to show. And basically on the left, I'm showing an RGB, red, green, blue image. And on the right, I'm showing a false cover image. That is a really pretty scene. That's scene number 10. But let's say I wanted to go back and look at, I've already won, run this once. I hit shift return for any cell and I'm able to rerun a cell. This is a scene that has clouds. So this is scene number nine. You can see the clouds, you can see the cloud shadow. And this may or may not be useful because maybe if you're doing analysis over here near the airport, that's pretty clear. But if I'm doing analysis over here near the coast, that's not so good. 
That was scene number nine, which was June 13th. That was 50% cloudy. So let me go back to the uh, presentation here just to wrap up. And this will be my wrap up here. So what are we doing for the future? I'd like to expand the list of data sets. We are going to be soon adding Alos Pulsar Mosaics and Copernicus Land Cover. And we'll have a few notebooks that connect to those. We're going to be expanding our list of sample notebooks. We are going to be putting more notebooks out there for Sentinel-1 radar in the coming weeks. ALOS and land cover classification will have some notebooks. And then, of course, sustainable development goals. I want to do something for water, urban, and land degradation, which will touch a few um, of these SDGs and allow people to use it. Finally, a comment that I have here, this sandbox is fantastic for educators. I've already been talking to a number of educators. I've talked to people at the high school level. I've talked to people at the university level. This is a great tool for students to get uh, at touching satellite data for the very first time, just taking a look at it, becoming familiar with it, and also doing simple Python programming. How does Python work? How do I run a notebook script? How do I actually see the results and play around? I've been, uh, been um, using this with that thought in mind for education. And then whoop, let me go and just say um, thank you again, the sandbox link openearthalliance.org sandbox. You'll find a user form there. If you want to know more about installing the Open Data Cube in any other cloud framework, go to opendatacube.org. So I will come back to my screen here. Hang on a second. And I will stop sharing. And I'm back again to answer any questions. I think we have about seven minutes, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kilo. Uh, you do indeed have about seven minutes, and you All actually right. have about five or so questions. Um, there are. Let me let me just jump into some of them, and then maybe you know you can you can take them as you as you'd like. And so sure. there's 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 an interesting question here. It's asking, you know, how are developing country governments receiving initiatives like this? Um, are they expressing any kind of concerns regarding you know potential interference in their Internal affairs are are there are they thankful for support? I realize that's a little more um, you know political than technical. Um, and then there's another question there too, asking if maybe you could provide a little bit um, additional details in terms of the of the integration with Earth Engine. Yep. Um, and wow, questions are actually now starting to just uh, roll in. Well, um, let me ask. Let me answer those first two really quick. So, yeah, sure, please. Developing countries. Uh, they are definitely accepting this and liking this. So when I said that we have over 100 countries using Open Data Cube in various parts around the world, it's primarily because developing countries have adopted this. And here's what they like about it. It's open source. They can do whatever they want with it. And they ultimately control how it's being used and the data that they want to access. So the, the best way is you know, to connect it to some data that sits on a cloud somewhere. There are countries that are using this locally, like Mexico has their own data cube running in country where they've downloaded the data and they manage the data locally. So that's also possible. But here's the key difference. Here's the key thing that connects all of this around the world. If, if an algorithm is developed in Mexico or an algorithm is developed over in Africa, we can share it among the community. So that really cool algorithm over in Digital Earth Africa, I'm now using that in the Pacific Islands for coastal change. So we can share, and that's kind of the thing is this common sharing platform. And then there was also a question about the integration with, with Earth Engine. The, the reason we chose to integrate this with Earth Engine is number one, we can get to their data sets. Their data sets are fantastic, right? They're always there. And using that CoLab environment gives me a free way to run Jupyter Notebooks where I'm using Google's providing me the processing power, right? I don't, I'm not paying for anything. So it's really nice for doing demonstrations. But again, if you want to scale this, if you want to do an analysis for an entire country, you probably want to go to Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, Microsoft Planetary, you know, or Azure Cloud, something like that. Uh, go ahead. Any more questions? Yeah, thank you so much. And again, it's like there's a flood of questions actually coming in through Venueless. Um, I guess some some related questions, and well, I guess before that, thank you too for for queuing up. Um, we're later going to have a presentation from Jimena Juarez from uh, Inehi, where she's going to be talking about the um, Mexican implementation of the Open Data Cube. Uh, I know I her we well. Have... We work together, so I'm excited <laughs> to see that presentation. Awesome. Um, but in the same vein, 
Uh, there are two kind of related questions. One is uh, somebody is asking, how could users collaborate with CIOS to develop uh, open data cubes for their own areas? And so I know you spoke about, um, you know, the African data cube, uh, the work in Australia, the work in Mexico. So how could users, you know, uh, set up their own cubes besides using, you know, what you presented? So, so we have, we've been helping a number of countries around the world. The reason we have about a hundred countries using it is because we have a community of open data cube users that help each other get these things going and teach people how to, to get the data cube going. So I would suggest people go to opendatacube.org, go to our general website. There's actually a help link there or like a, a contact, I think it's contact us or something like that. If they send out a request to that contact us link, we will get that, our Open Data Cube community, and then one of us will respond to them and help them guide them about what they would like to do, answer their questions. So my office, because I, I work with CIOS and I work um, you know, internationally, our job really is to help users around the world connect to satellite data. This is a mechanism by which we can do that, and we're excited to, to help people uh, move forward and try this. So you know, that's how we help the Swiss uh, have done this. So, uh, you know, Greg Giuliani at, at, at UNEP has now created a Swiss data cube. He started with something over Geneva and now it's expanded for the whole country and he's working with the government. We got that connection with Mexico. We got that connection with Colombia. So a lot of times it starts small with a small individual or an organization. And then eventually when that individual organization shows some value in it, it then might expand to be bigger and the government might adopt it or some other uh, institution. And we also have private companies that have taken it too, because it's free, it's open. Go ahead. No, thank you so much. And and again, you know, there's it's just weird. There's all these questions that are that are coming in, and maybe one suggestion as well. Uh, we can send you the link to Venue List, and maybe you know you I would love, can, yeah. can follow I can, up. I, I'd be questions. more than happy to uh, respond to any of these, uh, and and people can reach out to me directly. You know, find me out there. Just Google Brian Kilo. You'll you'll probably find my email address on NASA and uh, I'd be happy to hands, answer any any questions in more detail. Sure. Any, any uh, others that you see? Emil? Yeah, yeah. So there are definitely a few uh, data integration questions uh, before we turn it back over to, uh, to Francis. Uh, and so there's a question about, are there any plans for integrating uh, interferomet interferometric products? Are there plans to integrate other types of data like geological maps, uh, field data, et cetera? Um, and then there was also another related question asking about if you could provide details on the uh, different Python libraries that the ODC work is uh, leveraging. Right. So um, I'll start with that last one there. Just, you know, the, the Python libraries and things that we use in our utilities. If you go to GitHub and you look at um, uh, those those GitHub notebooks, there's some references there to some some links and utilities. So. Um, go go to that openearthalliance.org slash sandbox. There's a little bit more depth of detail about where we store our utilities that are loaded up and how all this works in the background. So there was a question about other data sets. So we've started with the big ones, right? The ones that most people use, the Landsats and the Sentinels. Over time, we are going to try to integrate more data sets in there. Interferometric data sets, well, there is nobody that stores those regularly for the world, right? They're just really hard to get at. So if you're going to do something with an interferometric data set for radar, likely you're going to be the holder of that data set. And then perhaps you would want to locally install Open Data Cube on top of it in order to perform analyses. So we're doing some testing in CIOS. We, we're doing some things with what is the definition of analysis ready data for interferometric data. So we're doing some of that work. If you go to CIOS.org slash ARD, you can see all the stuff we're doing on uh, analysis ready data. So that's probably my time. Thank you very much for all of that. Thanks for uh, sharing this. And uh, I look forward to answering any other questions if people want to reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brian. It seems that uh, a lot of people were really interested in learning more about the Open Data Cube uh, initiatives.